hosting this forum. I mean, I think one of the really exciting things that's been happening actually in the time that I've been in this job is the continued growth of the U35 network. I don't know if we can really take any credit for it in the leadership, but I do want to acknowledge Josh's tremendous role and all of the other uh, act activists who are involved. I think the union um, has been well prepared for the growth of the U35 network in terms of uh, the pre-existing kind of networks and subcommittees that we had and that kind of democratic structure. But it was very, it was great to be able to um, approve the U35 representatives to representative to council at the last conference uh, and take part in that process. So look, I'm, I, I better get on with it. People tell me I'm getting much more garrulous the longer I am in this job and um, I should take it on board. Um, I'm standing on my record and I'm also seeking your endorsement for a vision of the future. The strength of Te Hautu Kaharangi has been forged by many years of collective struggle, mutual support, and shared achievement by members. Um, I've provided experienced, resilient, hardworking leadership over the last year and a half uh, to maintain and grow that momentum. We continue to become ever more effective as a change maker in tertiary education. I think we're providing clear and steady leadership through the COVID-19 pandemic and associated issues, uh, such as unsustainable workloads and the loss of international students. And we've made substantial progress on the goals which I emphasized when I first saw the election. Uh, and those are really that we continue to develop our campaigning as a union, both politically and industrially. Um, members have been well supported to foreshadow industrial action and to step forward and take such action when alternatives have been exhausted. And there's a few examples I could cite of that recently. Negotiating from strength wherever possible, we are developing more unified and hence more powerful bargaining strategies for collective agreements in the universities, in the polytechnics, Wananga, and across the sector. We're also beginning to see growth in our overall membership numbers after many years of gradual decline. Growth is one of our five, now one of our five strategic goals in the union, and it was a goal that I identified for myself as president. And a lot is being done to improve our recruitment systems and activities. This work supports all our other goals. I'm sorry, should, can you hear me clearly? It's just, I hear Sandra has started talking loudly in the next room, and anyway, the walls are paper thin here. But look, um, growing our union um, supports all our other goals. Our financial position as a union has also improved. Uh, allowing us to invest more in areas where we need more staff and resources. And we'll see shortly a bit more evidence of that coming through. Um, improving member participation in the union and building from this into greater staff involvement and influence in the workplace, this has been an area in which the union has advanced significantly. The reform of vocational education is a huge win for us. Um, we're continuing to make the most of this opportunity. Uh, insisting that our voice is heard both at the branch and the national level in every aspect of the design and decision making of NZIST in the larger system. And Tina and I took part in a sort of co-design process yesterday on the staff representation system in NZIST and that's looking pretty exciting. Um, we will be investing uh, more staff capacity in campaigning and supporting member participation. The advance we're making in these areas should flow on to the university sector, and it will be a goal of my second term to make sure that happens. And I think I said before that we've, you know, we've been aiming to support campaigning in the union, and of course in the universities, Victoria University is a current example of, of that. Um, again, <laughs> you know, I mean a massive uprising of, of, of the people. Um, it's happened before at Victoria, but I, I think you know, we are in a good position to support that. And it really is exciting kind of to see uh, and could have um, tremendous uh, power actually as a bit of a precedent and a, a warning to others. But overall, I'll be ensuring, have you I have come gone, to the end of my time? You have right. gone over time, but um, if you're cool. midway through a sentence and you want to finish it. Um, <laughs> no, I think that, that's probably enough for me. Thank you very much. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. Um, I will now pass the floor over to Tina. Kia ora to um, everybody, called Tina Smith Ahu. Um, first of all, thank you very much to Josh um, for making this opportunity, and thank you all for giving up your precious time to be here to listen to both Michael and I. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, my vision for TU is the same as it's always been. Uh, 
Tertiary Education, and particularly TU, is a people-based organisation. It's about people, people first. So um, my background, as you know, is I'm a nursing lecturer. I've also been an academic um, in teaching for 35 years. Oh, I hate saying that because I like to think I am 35. Um, I still try to tell my students I'm somewhere between 21 and 35 years of age, and that's where I am in my heart. Um, but I have experience. I've, I've lived through some of the difficulties that our sector has faced. I'm someone who's always been a strong voice, who's always tried to stand up to care about our colleagues. Care and respect are two of my really strong values. And my vision for TU is that we're doing some things incredibly well, but we have to embed those values of care and respect in everything we do. Care and respect for our members. And that's what we want for our sector. We want all our staff, to feel respected and valued, and along with that is decent work conditions and decent pay. I know it sounds very trite, but you guys are the future. You are the ones at under 35 who have the energy to pick up the fight, to carry it on. You are the ones who want a better world, not only for our students, but for our whole society. Education is a social good. We need to make sure that that is recognised and respected. We as the educators who put forward the vision and the future through education for our society also need to be held in that high regard. One of the things um, that's been really important to me and one of the platforms that I've taken on National Council is that we need to put greater investment into development. So um, we are an education union. We need to be doing more around offering developmental sessions, you know, education sessions, um, opportunities to develop for people in TU. Part of that, I think, will bring in some of our membership. Um, members want something that they see as tangible. So we've had a really strong political stance and I totally, totally support that. I love the fact that um, in the ITP sector, this is our opportunity. We're building a new opportunity and we're co-designing that. So we have to be politically active, but we can't forget that our members want us to be standing alongside them, hearing what's important to them and taking up their issues and fighting for what they need. So we do have campaigns around insecure work. Um, we do have campaigns around um, workload, but we need to be stronger on some of those. So uh, I was in the TU Women's workshop the last couple of days and one of the big things that I kept hearing is some of our particularly younger lecturers who are trying to get their, their career established, who have family obligations uh, and they're facing workloads that are just unreasonable. If these are the issues that are people are facing on the ground, we need to direct more resources to working on those issues. So my vision is that we will be respected, recognised, that we will stand strong together, that we'll be an amazing loud voice that allows for many different voices. And again, one of the things that education does for me is allows people to see through a window. And when we talk about um, how we want education in our union to be. It's about equity, it's about respecting diversity, and that it has got foundational efforts around tatiriti or watangi. I'm a nurse, you work in partnership with people. First of all, you listen. You listen to what's important to them, what they need, then you help work alongside them so that they actively participate and that they work in partnership with you to get what they need as the outcomes for them. And we need to have 
really good systems in place, we need to have really good campaigns in place that support the different voices and the different areas of our sector. Um, I'm somebody who really, really values our general staff um, as well as our academic staff. General staff, I can't do without. Secretaries, IT, hey, that's important. All people are important. Hei tangata, hei tangata, hei tangata. Kia ora. Thanks, Tina. Um, I am now going to move on to some questions that came through um, Josh from um, under 35 members. And I want to focus um, first off on the kind of political context of the union. Um, and so there are a couple of questions to this theme. Um, and I want to begin um, by challenging you on a statement that came through from one of the members that said, recently I've noticed that the TU is moving towards the centre of the political spectrum. Do you agree with this statement? And if you do, do you think that it's a good thing? So Michael, I'll begin with you and then we'll alternate who um, who begins uh, first. So what are your thoughts on this statement? Well, I, I think in terms of the values and the objectives of the union, I'd say that uh, we have uh, taken up a, a kind of fairly traditional left-wing, uh, left-of-centre position. Uh, that is to say that we've been campaigning to remove competition from the tertiary education sector. I mean, I think, you know, Sandra inaugurated, um, Sandra Gray, our, our former national president and our national secretary, inaugurated really uh, a process whereby we've set a kaupapa, which is, I think, decisively left of centre uh, in the sense that it's, it's uh, about eliminating the neoliberal legacy. It's about uh, and we've done that to some extent with Rove. You know, we really have, there's, there's agreement in that part of the sector that removing competition is the key factor. I'm, I'm quite surprised actually at the level of buy-in from the leadership now uh, of, of institutions and of, from NZIST itself on that factor. So, I, you know, and I'm very much in support of that direction. I d I'm not sure what, you know, so that's, and, and that's of course our co-papa for the university sector as well. You know, it's a fairly traditional, you know, to some extent centralised, uh, you know, government uh, and, and the society more generally should be providing free education, should be providing all of them, you know, there's no buy-in at all to the neoliberal model of uh, education as a private good and so on. So I just think in that education space, I'm very happy with where we're positioned and I think it's very much left of centre in quite a traditional sense. Thanks, Michael. Tina? Um, thank you for the opportunity to respond to that. I, I don't agree with the statement. Um, I do think that um, we have had a left view. I personally am um, um, very openly um, red-green, so <laughs> I state my colours um, openly to everybody. Um, I believe in the environment, I believe in health, and I believe in education, and uh, some really things that are very important to me. Um, in my involvement in TU at a national level, I've spent four years on the Industrial Professional Committee and the last four years on council. So um, I know very strongly some of the campaigns that we have run. And many people, particularly younger members, may not be aware, um, we had nine years under a national government. During that time, more than $3.4 billion was sucked out of tertiary education. Um, I lived through, as many of our members did, what that did to education. I also know that the previous national government tried to bring in a tertiary amendment and other matters bill before the last election. Um, part of that bill was that um, private providers would have equal access to um, taxpayer funding to provide tertiary education. Um, Stephen Joyce personally wanted the whole ITP sector privatised. He ran it down to sell it off to privatiser. Um, I know that I was a really strong voice on council and council backed me completely and Sandra Gray was a fantastic leader. We fought that education amendment um, bill. And our union was the main one who got out there and fought that. Then what we did before the last election is we went around the politicians and we took photos of them holding signs, um, Chris Hipkins, Jacinda Ardern, people like that, saying, I support publicly funded education 
free publicly funded tertiary education. Well, not free, but publicly funded education. And free education is the ideal down the track. So we've been politically active. We did run a campaign with our members. We do have to be careful. Some of our members, particularly in the university, are not left wing. So I think we are respectful that people can hold different political views. And I do think it's good to be respectful that people are entitled to their own political views. Um, however, uh, we need to be really clear what our values are, and our values are that education is a social good, that education should be publicly funded, and that staff working in tertiary education should have decent conditions and decent salaries, and that's what we should campaign on. Wonderful, thank you. Um, the next question is, the TU hasn't endorsed any parties in the upcoming election. Um, who do you want to win the election? Um, and I think, Tina, you've already stated your political colours, but um, if you just want to, maybe you can just say it again, um, but just try and keep this. This is kind of a simple question, so keep your answers brief would be great. So I want a Labour Green government. Yay! <laughs> keep up the change, keep the change in a positive direction. Yep, that's me. Thanks, Tina. Michael? Uh, well, look, we will be putting out something that, that is a guide for members, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that will show that, that the Labour Party and the Green Party are the parties to vote for. I mean, I've, I've stood as a Green Party uh, candidate in, in two elections, uh, 2008 and 2011, so my, my politics are well known, I guess. Um, so, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm really interested to hear how many Labour activists are very keen that, you know, um, Kylie, who works with me, is very active in, in the Labour Party. And she says, talking to fellow activists, they all want the Green Party to be part of the, the next coalition. So I'm just really pleased to hear that. Cool. So, um, yeah. Great. Um, we're going uh, to move on to, um, I guess, a less uh, intense or political question. And it's just about getting to know uh, you both um, as people. So do you have any hobbies or, and how do you unwind? Michael. Oh, is it, me? Is it my, am I first? Yeah, I'll let you go um, first. I actually found this really, I found this a quite a difficult question. Um, you know, I, my, I, I really mainly respond to the demands of people in my sort of whanau. So my, my two daughters, um, my wee dog, he's very demanding. And um, when I get a wee bit of time, actually philosophy is my you know, thing. And I just like reading a bit of philosophy if I can get a chance. Yeah. It sounds great. Tina? Um, well, I acknowledge that my one of my failures as a union people, person is that I'm a workaholic. However, I find that most union people work far too hard and far too long. So um, I'm also a night person. So for me, when I have a weekend or a time off, the first thing I do is have a sleep in because I usually need it. So I like that blob sleep in time. Um, and then it's all about people. So uh, it's about family and it's about friends. So I have a fantastic uh, group of friends. We call ourselves the Fabulous Five. Um, and we get together on a regular basis and we just laugh and chat. Um, and the other thing that I do for fun, I know it sounds ridiculous, but um, I, I love being up to date with politics and with research. So my other two side tracking hobbies are that I read the research um, that comes across my desk and then I listen to national radio and make sure that I'm totally up to date. So then I'm good at what I do as a lecturer. Yeah, that's me. Nice. I have to join you on being an RNZ fan. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Every day. Sure, I'm sure everyone here is, will um, you know, agree that they're great. Um, so I just, this is going back to kind of a serious question, um, although it was great, um, you know, getting to know you both as people more. Um, so would you consider challenging academic promotion freezes on equity grounds? Um, so Tina, I'll begin with you. Absolutely. <laughs> I am somebody who's um, um, done a lot of challenges of management all the time. Again, I come back to this value system. You know, if you say that you believe in equity, if you say that you believe in fairness, then you have to stand up and act. And that's been my story. So um, I'm the well-known stir 
in our institution. I'm the one who stands up and fights and argues. I've led our first industrial action. Um, I don't hesitate to um, go to bat over things like that. In our own institution, um, I've been involved in negotiations for 10 years and we've just um, made progress on um, our academic framework and that's what I'm doing part of this weekend is writing a challenge to how they're doing our salary review um, process this year and trying to come up and put forward another alternative. So yes, I challenge, but I also like to try to put forward alternatives that, that may be fairer and better. And one of the things that I do always try to consider is that institutions are between a rock and a hard place because the big problem in our sector has been funding. So um, I put a lot of my effort also with management is keeping them a little bit on side and saying, you know, you are so lucky to have TU out there fighting for you to get more funding for our sector. So you need to do this because we're trying to do this for you. So this is the solution. This is about fairness, about justice, and absolutely. So in terms of equity, it's not about um, money, but just one last point that's my latest little campaign. Um, as part of my one of my nursing programs, my um, one of my education and communication papers, I teach about gender diversity. But I'm always keen to learn, and if anybody wants to go on my um, TU for President Facebook page, I've already done a post on this. Um, I went along to a gender diversity workshop last week because I think it's really important that we're up to date and we keep listening to the voices of the people that live this experience. And uh, and one of the things is, you know, 42% of people who are in the Rainbow community feel they have to hide that. That, that is so sad and so wrong. You know, they suffer from nine times the minority stress 40% of people who identify as rainbow suffer from depression. You know, as a nurse, as an educator, this is absolutely wrong. And one of the things that one of the trans people in the workshop mentioned was the difficulty around toilets. And which toilet do you go to? And, you know, like, I have no problem and have always said, well, we need gender neutral toilets. But what this person taught me in this workshop was that rather than saying gender neutral, we should have a sign on the door that says in this toilet is a cubicle or is a urinal or a whatever. And that to me made so much sense. So for me, you listen to people, you find out what they want and you campaign for that. So guess what? That's the new campaign that I'm on in my institution that we relabel all the toilets about what's inside and consider them gender neutral. Yeah, Thank that's about equity. Thank you. Um, Michael. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I, um, I, I sort of took a slightly more technical approach to this question, um, for better or worse. Um, you know, because I, I, I'm assuming that ECRs are um, early career researchers. Is that, is that right? I'm certainly, um, you know, I'm promoting the use of the term ECAs, early career academics. Of course, um, if I was just a bit younger, I might have been one of those. But um, there's no point in me pretending that I'm really at the beginning of an academic career. But this, look, early career, uh, you know, I think we do need to start talking about early career academics. That They need to be a kind of group that we identify as having particular needs. Same with early career researchers. The, when I say a technical approach, I mean, we're in a, a, an era of pay restraint. There's a, a letter from the um, uh, State Services Commissioner that sets out the terms of that pay restraint. We don't, you know, we are working very hard to make sure that we are no more restrained in bargaining than we need to be. I think the settlement at Otago, uh, at Otago University, I don't believe there is a freeze on um, promotions uh, in progression at the moment. We will be arguing for that across the board. Um, the, 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 the instructions from the State Services Commissioner say that uh, 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 that they can, we can continue to address gender and ethnic pay inequities. 
But I think we need to be arguing that there are inequities uh, that, that for early career academics and early career researchers. Uh, and so um, we're, and we're, yeah, we're also looking at retaining jobs as a priority. That is actually a part of the State Services Commission advice to retain people and jobs as a priority. We're furious that that bit gets overlooked. Of course, everyone takes from this kind of advice what they want, but we'll, I, we will be arguing uh, for, for continued progression, particularly, and I think this is a point well made in this question, that it needs to be for early career academics and researchers. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Um, so following on, um, on, a, um, on a similar topic, is a question from a member and I read out, how will you work to support workers who are transgender to continue working whilst they're transitioning? We transgender people often require time off that cisgender or non-transgender people wouldn't. For example, when a non-binary person um, needs to take time off to um, uh, get uh, health support. Um, so I'll begin with Michael and then move on to Tina um, and then we'll go to questions from the floor. Yeah, I mean, look, I think there are, you know, this is an area where we should be developing a claim uh, for bargaining. Um, you know, a well-worded claim that fits around our existing uh, provisions. In most of our collective agreements, we have as and when required sick leave. You know, we would need to think, I think, about what we're asking for in the pay claim, if it may be some adjustment to that wording, to recognise, first of all, that uh, requirements for uh, hormonal treatment, for, uh, for surgery, for time off for those processes, are absolutely legitimate um, healthcare needs. Uh, and it may be that that's all that's required in addition to those clauses to say these are legitimate needs and will be recognised uh, as such uh, in the administration of this clause. One of the really uh, infuriating things about um, some of our employers is that those as and when required sick leave provisions, actually the average use by members uh, would be about three days a year under a voluntary, uh, under those provisions. If you have sort of 10 days allocated per year, people, and you accumulate them, people will tend to use what they're entitled to and what they accumulate. Uh, but in fact, institutions do terribly well under those provisions in terms of economizing on sick leave. People don't use it unless they need it. And I think, you know, we'd need to develop a claim, but I think we can, we should be advocate so that we don't say more than we need to. We don't want to, um, but that we get that recognition, first of all, that the, the, the needs of, cis, uh, of transgender people in, tra uh, in transitioning are legitimate health needs and will be recognized within the ambit of that clause uh, and so on. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Tina. Well, hey, I'm a nurse. <laughs> health needs are health needs. And uh, I'm absolutely fully respectful that when anybody has a health issue, their health needs should be met. And part of the thing about leave requirements is that we need to make sure that our staff members are well supported around the leave that they need to meet their health needs. You know, in terms of um, equity and equality, people keep often thinking about equality, which is sameness, which you treat everybody the same. Um, equity isn't about sameness. It's about saying that some people need more than others. And part of what ensuring good equity policies that we have in place ensure is that people who need that extra step, somebody or something extra to enable them to have the same outcomes, that's what we need to put in place. So we need to fight not only for sick leave, but we need to have a greater fight around equity. And we do need to try to push this not only through our institutions, um, at a national level through TU, and I think TU's, you know, really committed to equity and diversity anyway. I think, I think you've, that's already in place. But we need to have policies and keep fighting this at a national level. One of the things that I'm mindful of now is that um, we have Tangihanga leave. So Tangihanga leave um, realises that for around death and dying, 
uh, people's needs can be different. And I think what we need to have is around sick leave, that people's needs can be different. So we have young people with young families that need time off to look after their children and keep their families well. We need um, some older people who are also looking after even older people who need some time off to keep themselves well. You know, somebody who's transitioning, somebody who's looking after family, all these are legitimate things to keep people well. If there's any good outcomes from COVID-19, one of the things that I hope will be an outcome is that people will have a greater respect for health and well-being for knowing that we need to keep ourselves and keep our communities well. And that's not only physically, that's psychologically and socially, and I hope also environmentally. So we need to have a wider view of sick leave, but it needs to be based in an equity framework. Thanks, Tina. So, um Thanks both of you for answering those questions. I'm now going to open it up to the floor. I haven't seen any questions come through by the chat, um, but does anyone have a question that they would like to kick off with? Danny, great, over to you. Tina and Michael. So I guess I've written it down just so I can hopefully be precise and clear about what I'm asking here. Um, so beyond being a union or even just an organization in general, I have kind of a strategical question. So um, aside from, you might not identify uh, the TEU as either of these things, but if you were to choose one, um, would you identify the union as more of like a service for workers in the sector or as a grassroots movement? Uh, and for context and for this question, um, in working with kind of the young precariat as a tertiary level tutor myself, I've noticed that aside from that cluster of policy nerds in our circles that U35s understand the language and structuring of a social movement a lot more than they do um, more institutional logics and um, you know the, the bureaucracy of the of the of the trade union kind of thing. So I guess how yeah would you see us the TU overall as more of a service or as a movement, and um, how do you kind of reconcile that difference of perspective that we have as U35 compared with the rest of the membership? You know we'll begin with you. Um, and just for the interest of time, we'll try and keep the um, answers to um, a minute-ish. Sorry, I thought that was addressed first to Michael. Do you want me to answer it? Or Michael? I, th I think it's for both of us. I'm happy e to go first. Equator, both. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, do you want to go first? Do you, do you want to choose who you want to answer that first? Yep, Tina, you begin. Okay. All right. One of the things that I know from um, my years in the union is that you have to have both structure and function. And for anything to work well, it has to have this, the service aspect because that's what the people on the ground want. Um, but it has to have, that's the function, but it has to have some of the um, structure that keeps things working and makes sure that Again, all voices are heard, that we put our resources to meet a range of needs. So one of the things that I love about social media, and I'm not good at social media, that's why I need you know, wide skills and the collective brain. Um, I'm not the expert on that, but I love this grassroots movements that are coming out through social media because I think those voices are really important. But I think we need structures in place that can um, tap into those, use those, hear those, as well as providing that on the ground service function. Because at the end of the day, we are membership driven. And the thing about um, the union is it's about the collective. It's about people not only standing together as a whole group, but it's about that standing beside those in need. So we have to service those in need. And, and I know that I, you know, just this week, I've been dealing with three people who've been dealing with um, workloads or employment issues who just contact me. And sometimes they just want to talk. Sometimes they don't want a solution, they, by talking, they find their own solution. Sometimes I can give them some ideas. So, but then on a, a wider level, we have to keep, you know, getting everybody on the same 
in the same direction. But that again is why I come back to what we need to do as a union is put more into um, running some sessions about how we develop both ourselves, both some of the values. You know, I think we need to have more union organized um, education around tertility, around equity, around diversity, because so those are some of the core values in our union. And they can tap into the social movement, but they can also provide that service zone. Kapai. Thanks, Tina. Michael? Kia ora. Yeah, look, great question. Um, you know, this has uh, been a kind of struggle in the union movement for quite a while, to move away from a servicing model to a campaigning or organizing, sometimes it's called, or now we tend to call it campaigning model. That means that really all of our causes need to be framed in terms of social justice or values. Uh, and, you know, we need to, um, we need to sort of unite, we need to put, I mean, that's also tied up with growth in the union. It's about building that collective strength as the priority. But there's always a tension in unions between that and the sort of what we call the servicing model. Uh, and we're very fortunate in our union that people like Tina, branch presidents and others do do some of that servicing for us, uh, enabling us to, to, to campaign more broadly. But, you know, we have, as I say, we've made growth one of our strategic goals. That reflects, that I think complements those other goals that are all about campaigning. Um, campaigning for better terms and conditions, campaigning on a broader social justice front. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, campaigning to eliminate competition to get a, a, an equitable, fully accessible, publicly funded uh, education system. So yeah, look, we aim to be more of a movement. We aim to be a, a collective campaigning body. Body, we're always trying to sort of prioritise that. Uh, and yeah, we and and that we're still working on that with some of our organisers and, and others because it's easy to get caught up in the servicing. As I say, particularly actually with the the, the paid, uh, it's easy to get caught up in a servicing model. But um, yeah. We, we are, we put ourselves firmly on the side of the organising campaigning model. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions um, from the floor? Cool. Uh, Josh, are there any more questions that have come through to you or you have? No, there's, there's no more questions that have come through through the, um, through the survey monkey. I wonder, we've got about four minutes left. So Michael and Tina, if you just want to have one minute each and kind of sum it up and then we'll end for today. And strictly a minute, because I realize that people um, may have to leave at one. Um, Michael? Yeah, kia ora. Uh, look, the, the wee bit of my standard blurb that I didn't get through at the beginning um, was about tertility or waitangi and, and power sharing in the union. Uh, I, I'm certainly committed to doing that, we, we hope that we will have uh, some proposals to put to our conference that will see us move to you know, co-leadership um, models uh, in the near future. Uh, and more broadly, of course, we're socialising the values of Te Tiriti o Waitangi through our um, Te Kawiki framework. Um, and so those are the, that's something I hope to mention. Uh, as I say, I'm standing on my record of, of actually kind of enacting some of the things that I've campaign for in the past uh, and I really like the chance to continue for another two years or a little over two years uh, to fulfill some of those objectives. It takes a while to get your, your head around this job and to become effective in it. Um, I think I'm starting to show that I can be effective in it and I'd like a chance to continue with that. Kia ora. Kia ora Michael. Uh, Tina. Thank you uh, to all of those that are under 35 for both listening to this and most importantly for getting involved in tertiary education. You guys have the energy, you have passion, um, and you have so much to bring to our sector. What I want for you is a union that will stand alongside you, that will work with you and support you to ensure that you get secure education, well pay, and are able to develop and grow. What I also ask of you is that you encourage all those that are younger to get involved in TU, to actually get active, to look after their colleagues, older and younger, right? because together we are stronger. And I really live those values 
and I'm sure that many of you do too. I love the fact that younger people have the commitment to the environment as well as the commitment to social justice. So let's together make New Zealand better through having a wonderful tertiary education sector that we are active participants in. Right. Well, thank you, Kōrua. Um, thank you very much, Josh, for organising this session. Um, and yeah, for special taking, thanks. Yeah, it's great. Um, and for taking um, this time out of your day to come along. I think that as um, members of unions, it's great that we can engage. Often we are not the people that are actively involved in unions, um, but I think it's really important that as um, the kind of next, uh, you know, not just as leaders of tomorrow, but as of leaders of today, um, we are actively involved in the union movement. So thanks for all the work that you're doing um, in your institutions and for um, being involved in the union. So over to you, Josh. Uh, kia ora koutou. So I'll end the session now. Um, Please, uh, if you're a member, make sure that you're engaging um, with any emails that come through. I know that the national presidential campaign will be ending in a few weeks, but we also have the vice presidential campaign that's open with the three different um, vice presidents. So it's really important you check your emails and your junk emails. They often come into my junk emails. Um, so it's important that you check to see where things are coming in. But if not, I hope I will see some, if not all of you, perhaps at some sort of conference, if there will if, if one's going ahead. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone for coming and thanks also Michael and Tina for giving up your time. Good day, everyone. Good day. Good day. Good day. Good day.